Thanks for checking out this No Spoilers review. Yes, this is for the fifth episode of the Creepshow series that's being shown on Shudder, that's being released weekly. Uh, if you don't know, I've been doing a review for every one of these episodes ahead of time, which is why I'm doing it as No Spoilers, because when these are going on to my YouTube channel, people have not seen them because they're not released yet. Shudder has been nice enough to be hooking me up with the screener copies like a week ahead of time for each episode. So... That said, uh, you can go back and watch all my other ones if you haven't seen them, and let's get into episode five. So, the two stories for this are Night of the Paw and Times is Tough in Musky Holler. One thing I want to say that applies to both of these stories up front is that the comic panel aspect of things, which has been used throughout the series, is used the heaviest in these two stories. Um... It could go wrong, but I actually think it works with these. It's mainly done for backstory effect. Uh, well, and in the Night of the Paw, it actually starts the, the storyline with it. And with a lot of the stories, that's kind of how they do some of the comic paneling. They start it that way. But um, this one, I, th I think both of these actually, this episode, these two stories, it works really well how they incorporate the comic panels into telling backstory for things. Um, it's cool. I like it. I like the way it works. I know there might be some people who don't really dig it, but I dig it. Okay, so for Night of the Paw, this one is written by John Esposito, who wrote, who wrote the scripts for Graveyard Shift. He wrote a script for Masters of Horror, and he did Theater Bazaar. So he's used to some anthology stuff. Uh, directed by John Harrison, who has been hard at work directing a bunch of these stories for Masters of Horror. He did The House of the Head, All Hallows Eve, and Lydia Lane's Better Half. Uh, then for acting for this one, Bruce Davison, from, best known from Harry and the Hendersons, but he has a lot of acting credits, uh, is in this. And he he's one of those guys where, like, if you don't necessarily know what he's from or you can't pinpoint him, you will see his face and just be like, I know that guy. I know I've seen him in, in something or many things before, but I just can't place it. He's one of those people. He's gotten a lot of work. A lot of like episodes of shows here and there and stuff like that, but he's 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 a face that people will recognize. And I will say, I have to say, his performance in Night of the Paw is very good, very good. Potentially the best performance of the series thus far. It's kind of between him and DJ Qualls and the Finger, but Davison, Bruce Davison, he really brought it. He did an excellent job. And to be honest, with this story and how it how it progresses in the dialogue and everything like that, and how heavy the dialogue is for Bruce Davison's character, this story lives or dies based on Bruce Davison's performance. And for that reason, I like this one because Bruce Davison really, really brought it for this performance. He did an excellent job. He's mesmerizing on screen. He delivers his lines with all the emotion that he's supposed to be using at any given time. I'm very impressed with his performance there. Um, nice directing on this one by John Harrison. I think in general, every single episode that John Harrison has directed has looked really good. He comes up with some interesting camera angles, um, really nice directing, good looks. Uh, the story unfolds in a very intriguing way, at least very early. It arises kind of a lot of questions in the viewer's mind of like, well, what's going on with this? What about this? Why are we doing this? So um, it sets up a lot of mystery to the story, which obviously slowly unfolds, and they kind of tell you what's going on with it, as they should. Uh, this is one of the longer ones, too. I think it clocked in around 25 minutes-ish. Uh, so actually, I think this is the, thus far the longest of all, the, all of these Creepshow series stories. There's a ton of dialogue to this, so there's not a ton of action. It does get to some of it, to other things going on, but there's a lot of dialogue to it. And like I said, the overwhelming majority of that lies with Davison and the character he's playing, and he does it well. So, This is an old story at heart. Uh, a lot of people already know this story. It'll definitely seem familiar. If you don't already recognize it based off the title, you will recognize it pretty much based off of uh, the first five minutes or so of it. Um, so it's an old story. It's a good story. It's stood the test of time, in my opinion. Uh, I like what they did with it for this, how they put their own kind of spin on it, the setting they used for it. It works. It's not anything phenomenal. It didn't revolutionize the story. It didn't change it massively. At the heart of it, it's still the exact same story. But 
I think that what they did to it didn't, it changed it enough that I enjoyed it and didn't look at it as, oh, it's the exact same story that I've seen a million times. So they updated it enough to be worth watching, in my opinion. Uh, the story basically speaks to the fear of pain and loss. This is something that, you know, is touched on in horror quite a lot. And I think the way that the script was written, the way that the story unfolds, I think it touches on pain and loss very well, very effectively. It's impactful. There's a twist at the end that is pretty good. Uh, I did enjoy the twist. Sorry, my wife's upstairs cooking. Just dropped something. Uh, there's a twist to the story that is pretty good. Uh... My biggest problem with this, though, towards the end, is there's a terrible computer graphics moment. Terrible CG at the end. Everyone will know what I'm talking about when you see it, or if you're watching this after the fact, when you saw it, everyone knows what I'm talking about. There's only one moment of CG in this, and it is awful. It looks so bad. It just speaks to why CG is terrible. It looks bad. And I they should have just gone a different direction, to be honest. Just, like, edit that out and do it in a different way. Um, no CG. It was bad. Uh, so the other, the other last thing that I didn't like so much is that there's a decision that one of the character make, one of the characters makes in this that they should have and would have learned a lesson about earlier in the story. And you'll know what I'm talking about. It's, it, when it happened, I was just like, I, this is not believable that this person is making this decision right now when they already learned they should not make that decision. So, you know, anyway, but I'd, I'd be interested to see what other people who have seen it think about that. So obviously put your comments down there. So that's my review on Night of the Paw. <sighs> giving it a review or giving it five, uh, uh, giving a star rating on the five star scale with half stars in play uh, amongst all of these short creep show stories. I'm going to give it a, a three and a half. You have three and a half stars. I liked it well enough. I thought it was pretty solid. All right, so now let's move on to Times is Tough in Musky Holler, which was the second one. Written by John Skip and Dory Miller. I could not find anything on a Dory Miller. I don't know who that is. John Skip, uh, he was credited with the story idea for A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. That's the most recognizable thing I could find. So relative unknowns, basically. This one, also directed by John Harrison, so you can rest assured the directing's handled well. The camera work is good. It looks aesthetically pleasing. Nice work, John Harrison. Doing a good job. Very very steady in the directing role there, bud. Uh, David Arquette is the big name in this one, and obviously most well-known for the Scream movies, but he's done some other stuff out there. And he did a really good job with this performance. It was weird to me, though, because he wasn't in the most central role in this story. And I would think when you bring in a name like David Arquette for something like this, that you would give him the role with the most dialogue, and they didn't. I think he played his role really well. He has a thick Southern accent, and he did the accent well. He did the role well. All his dialogue was was quite good. He delivered for what he was supposed to do. But I just think he should have been in the most dialogue-heavy role. And although I, I will say that the guy who had that role did a good job with it, but it just doesn't make sense. Like, when you're getting such a big name, you want them to have as much screen time as possible, typically. So, I don't know. That just seemed kind of weird to me. But uh, there's some dialogue in the very beginning of this. It starts with a bunch of dialogue, and it kind of seems like a time waster. The dialogue doesn't seem to really be going anywhere, and even when you get through to the end of it, it there, there wasn't a whole lot of reason for it. Uh, so it seemed like a bit of a time waster, which is weird, because I believe this is probably the shortest of all of these stories in the creep show series uh it's i clocked in around 15 minutes ish like 13 to 15 somewhere in there uh overall the dialogue is actually kind of rough in this to be honest it's not super well written in my opinion um the dialogue feels a little stilted although some of that could have to do with some of the delivery of the lines by some of the actors it just felt a little bit weird at times uh, like I said, directing's good. Um, there's a specific shot of an extended scene that's focused on the on the the face of a um, the head of of the main character, basically the guy who has the most dialogue in it, and it's a very extended um, cut, and it looks cool. The perspective of the camera on this person's head looks really cool, and I really like that. Um, 
once again, comic panels used a lot in this with backstory works pretty well. So in the end, there was a fun concept to this. It was really, really slow kind of getting there. And then they kind of reveal what the concept of it is and where it's going. And it's interesting. It's original-ish, and I liked it. But then they start to have the resolution at the end and all the, you know, things are eventually going to get crazy at some point with these. And that's when it's happening. And there's some good practical effects and some good gore and violence. But there's also a lot where they're cutting away from it. And it feels like this is your time when you need to show all of it. Because if you're doing this creep show series for Shudder specifically, what is the point of not going in all the way and showing as much gore and violence as you can when the story calls for it? Because the story is calling for it, but they are choosing to to cut away, to cut the camera away and show other things while what you should be seeing is going on. Granted, you see some of it, but in my opinion, it's not enough. I guarantee it has to do with budgetary constraints. It's almost always is like that. Maybe something to do with time constraint. I don't know, but I'm just saying that as an audience member, I felt cheated a bit with what was going on there, and there should have been more. But that's my assessment of that one. Uh, that's all I have to say about Times is Tough in Musky Holler. Overall, on a five-star scale with half-stars in play for this one, I'm going to give this one a two. This is getting a two-star. Not huge on it. There were some good aspects of it, like I said. Interesting concept, but not big on it. So, let me do like I've been doing. I'm going to rank all the stories thus far through ten episodes, uh, from the last to the first, in my opinion. And then, uh, yeah. So, my number ten at the moment is All Hallows' Eve. My number nine is Lydia Lane's Better Half. My number eight is Times is Tough in Musky Holler. My number seven is Gray Matter. My number six is Bad Wolf Down. My number five is Night of the Paw. My number four is The Companion. My number three is The Man in the Suitcase. My number two is House of the Head. And my number one is The Finger. So there you have it. I look forward to the final one to see what my final rankings are on this one. And uh, yeah, hopefully everyone is enjoying going through this with me. I would love to hear some of your rankings too. Put it down there in the comments thus far through these 10 uh, stories. What are you thinking? And then we'll, uh, we'll see what we think after all 12 are done. But thank you everyone for checking this out. Do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe. can help me out a lot with my channel. means very little to you because it takes like a second and it's painless and costs you no money. So just hit that for me real quick. I would appreciate that. But thanks for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.